So in this video, we're going to talk about the endospore stain, and this is activity 3-10. So the purpose of the endospore stain is to stain and visualize endospores and differentiate spore-forming cells from non-spore-forming cells. And again, this is going to be a differential stain. So just like we've looked at a gram stain, which is a differential stain, and we've looked at a capsule stain, which is a differential stain, an endospore stain is also a differential stain. It's going to differentiate between bacteria that produce endospores and those that don't. So let's talk about what is an endospore. An endospore is a structure and its function is to protect bacteria when conditions become harsh. So what does that mean? Well, let's say bacteria are growing and they come in contact with a harsh condition. Now, what could that harsh condition be? It could be a change in temperature. Maybe the temperature is too high. It could be a change in pH. Could be a change in dehydration, meaning there's not enough water available could be in response to UV exposure because UV light causes DNA to undergo thymine thymine dimers, which is going to mutate DNA. So UV is seen as a harsh condition as well. Nutrient loss, so not enough food being available, as well as oxygen concentrations. One of the things that you will see is that oxygen concentrations vary depending on different bacteria. So for some bacteria, they are aerobic, they grow where oxygen is present, and therefore for those bacteria, when O2 is not available, that would be seen as a harsh condition. And on the flip side, bacteria that are what we call anaerobic, meaning they grow without oxygen, for those bacteria, being in the presence of O2 is seen as a harsh environment, and in that case would form endospores. So these are just some different examples of harsh conditions in which bacteria will form endospores. And so you can think of this as a structure that bacteria produce, kind of like to go into hibernation. If you think about a bear going into hibernation during the winter, the endospore is a structure that bacteria use to basically go into hibernation, meaning they're going to wait it out until conditions become favorable. And so we start with our vegetative mother cell. So here's our vegetative mother cell. And this vegetative mother cell is metabolically active. That's the cell that's going to be actively dividing. When that cell encounters a harsh condition, it's going to undergo a process called sporulation, which means it's going to form the endospore. Now, endospores are structures that are resistant to heat and chemicals because they're made a, of a tough outer covering made of the protein keratin. This is the same protein that's found in our skin. And our skin acts as a good barrier to keep microbes out. And your skin is a very good barrier. In fact, most microbes can't penetrate intact skin. That's because that keratin protein is very tough. In the case of bacteria, when they form endospores, they're gonna package their DNA in this tough keratin shell. And that tough keratin shell is going to allow the bacteria to wait it out until conditions become favorable. So when that spore is forming within the vegetative mother cell, we refer to that as an endospore. Endo means within. So this is a spore that is still within the vegetative mother cell. In terms of where endospores can be located, they could be what we call terminal off to one end, they could be centrally located, they could be subterminal. They vary depending on the type of bacteria. And so when the cell undergoes sporulation, they're going to package their DNA into that keratin structure and they're going to basically form the endospore, which eventually the vegetative mother cell will break down and it will then just be simply a spore. And this spore can last for many, many years. On average, maybe about 50 years, but in some cases, millions of years. These spores, you can think of, almost verge on immortality. They can survive almost indefinitely. 
And so these spores, again, are basically a structure that bacteria produce to survive when conditions become harsh. Now, be careful. In other organisms, for example, if we talk about fungi, when we talk about the term spores, spores are a structure that are used for reproduction. They're used for the cell to divide. In the case of bacteria, a spore is not for reproduction. It is not for reproduction. In fact, it's almost the exact opposite. It's when the cell is not reproducing, meaning that is when it's dormant and it's not metabolically active. However, if that spore encounters favorable conditions again, maybe now food is available, the temperature is permissive, the oxygen concentrations are permissive, if the cell, if the spore encounters favorable conditions, it's going to undergo a process called germination. It's going to germinate and it's going to go back to being a vegetative mother cell. And so that spore goes back to being a cell that is metabolically active. And so this cycle can occur over and over again. Sporulation, so forming the spore, and then when conditions become favorable, they will germinate and go back to being metabolically active. And so this is kind of how the endospore works. Again, it's a structure that bacteria use to survive when conditions become harsh. Again, it's for survival and it's not for reproductive purposes. So let's look at some examples of medically important endospore producing bacteria. So most endospore producing bacteria are gram positive. There are some exceptions, but usually endospore producing bacteria are gram positive. And generally they fall within two genus. We have Bacillus. Bacillus species are going to be the ones that are aerobic, meaning that they grow when O2 is available. And we have Clostridium. Clostridium strains are going to be anaerobic, meaning they grow in the absence of oxygen. So bacillus are aerobic, clostridium are anaerobic. So for them, different O2 requirements are needed. So let's talk about some examples of medically important endospore producing bacteria. So the first one is going to be bacillus cereus or B. cereus. B. cereus is going to cause food poisoning within two to six hours of eating rice that's contaminated with bacteria. So let me explain how this works. So many of the bacteria that are within Bacillus and Clostridium, these are typically most commonly found in soil. They are soil type bacteria. So in the case of B. cereus, if this bacteria is in the soil and it's on the crop for the rice, right? So they harvest the rice, they dry it, they dehydrate it, that bacteria is going to undergo sporulation. It's going to form a spore, and the spores are going to be on the rice. So now, it, let's say you don't wash the rice, or you know you don't wash it well, and you take that rice, and now you cook it. Well, remember that endospores are basically going to be able to withstand high heat. So in the case of rice, when it became dehydrated and it formed an endospore, when you now take that rice and you put it in water and you cook it, the temperature often is not hot enough to kill those endospores. So what you're essentially doing is, is that the endospores are in that rice. Now, a lot of times, different places, maybe a restaurant, maybe at somebody's house, might leave rice out and it might sit warm for long periods of time. Think about what the problem with that is. If the condition is warm but not hot, and it's in rice, which now has starch, which is a food source, and moisture, water, because of how you cook the rice, you're creating basically the perfect storm. You're now giving that bacteria everything that it needs. It's got a permissive temperature, it has food, it has water, and so those spores that were on the rice are going to germinate and they're going to go back to becoming metabolically active and that is going to then cause food poisoning 
by eating that rice that's contaminated with that bacteria. And typically, again, it's going to happen within two to six hours of eating that rice. So if you get, you know, food poisoning within two to six hours of eating rice, it's likely that you have ingested B. serious. It's a common type of bacteria that can be found in rice and can cause food poisoning. Next, we have Bacillus anthracis. And Bacillus anthracis is the cause of anthrax. There are several forms of anthrax. There is um, cutaneous, so skin. There is uh, pulmonary, so in the lungs. Typically, a lot of this is transmitted through contact with animals, for example. Um, and there was an incidence in 2001 where, where somebody was mailing envelopes and within the seal of the envelope, they were putting bacillus anthracis endospores. And so when people would open the mail, they would inhale those spores from bacillus anthracis and pa patients or people became sick with anthrax and some people actually died from this. And so this was a type of what we call bioterrorism. So using basically living organisms as a form of terrorism. Next, we have Clostridium tetani. Clostridium tetani causes tetanus. Tetanus produces a toxin that causes lock jaws. It causes the muscles to lock up. And so typically when you think of tetanus, you probably think of like stepping on a rusty nail, etc. Typically it's going to be caused by a puncture wound. And if that bacteria is on, let's say that rusty nail and you happen to step on it and the bacteria gets into that wound, it can cause tetanus, which is going to cause the muscles to spasm. And so that is uh, what we call tetanus. And so many of us are protected against this because we have been immunized. So if you've ever had the DTaP vaccine, that is diphtheria, pertussis, which is whooping cough, and tetanus. And so that's going to protect you against those three diseases. And so typically you get a series of these when you're a child. And then as you get older, usually you'll get a booster, a tetanus booster, once every 10 years. And that should protect you. And so if you haven't had a tetanus booster and, you know, you step on something and you get a puncture wound, you know, a rusty nail, a sharp knife, something, then getting a tetanus vaccine would be the way to go to help protect you. Clostridium perfringens. Clostridium perfringens causes what we call gas gangrene. Gangrene is basically a condition in which the skin is going to rot and become necrotic. The problem with that is, remember I said that Clostridium perfringens, so Clostridium in general is anaerobic. It grows where O2 is not available. So if this organism gets in to a wound, for example, and the skin begins to rot, think about what type of environment that starts to cause. As the skin starts to die, as the tissue dies, right, it's no longer getting blood flow. And if that tissue is no longer getting blood flow, it's no longer getting oxygen. And now it's anaerobic. And so that is going to facilitate Clostridium perfringens to grow, and it's going to cause the tissue to become necrotic, and the tissue is going to die. And in many cases, when this happens, depending on the level of infection, sometimes the only course of action at that point is amputation. Because it, you can't just give an oral antibiotic. It's not going to get to the infection because you need blood flow. And there's not blood flow if the tissue is dead. So oftentimes, one of the ways that this has to be treated is simply through amputation to remove the limb or the appendage from the body that has the infection. And so these are just some examples. In lecture, we'll talk about even more examples of medically important endospore producing bacteria. But these are just some examples. So when we are doing our endospore stain, the way that this works is that we have to start by making a heat fix smear of Bacillus polymyxa. Now notice it's a bacillus species, 
So it is likely going to produce an endospore. So what we do is we take our slide and we put a drop of water, again, about the size of a nickel. And in that drop of water, then we would use a needle and our aseptic technique to pick up Bacillus polymixa and swirl it into the water, making that water go about the size of a quarter. Then we would air dry on a slide warmer, and then we would do our heat fix step, which remember means we'll pass it through our flame three times in order to kill the bacteria and adhere it to the slide. So the first thing we have to do before we can even stain our slide is we need to make our heat fix smear of Bacillus polymixa. Now, once we have our heat fix smear and we've already heat fixed it, then we have to steam the slide with malachite green. Now, the reason that we have to steam the slide is because remember that that endospore is a tough keratin structure. It's not easy for dye to penetrate. So we have to steam in order for the dye to be able to get into the endospore. So the way that we do this, and I have a video to show you this in just a minute, is that you would take a beaker of water and you would boil it. And then on top of the beaker, you would put the slide across the top and you would add malachite green to the slide and let it sit for five minutes. Now during that five minutes, it's important that you keep it covered, that it doesn't dry out. So you might have to keep adding the malachite green for five minutes. So now if we compare what the cells would look like at different stages, so on the left we have a spore producing bacteria and on the right we have a non-producer of spores. So when we steam with our malachite green, notice that in the case of our spore producing bacteria, both the vegetative cell and the endospore is going to become stained. So at this point, both structures are green. In a non-spore producer, the cell is going to be green because malachite green is a basic stain. It's going to stain the cell. So at this point, all of the structures are stained with the malachite green. Then we decolorize with water. So we simply just add water to the top of the slide and let it run down. Now, the water is going to remove the dye from the vegetative cell. So notice that in a spore-producing bacteria, the endospore is still green. That water is not enough to take the dye out of the spore. But the vegetative cell has become colorless. In the non-spore-producing, the vegetative cell is colorless because when we add the water, it decolorizes the malachite green out of that vegetative cell. Then we add safranin to our slide, and safranin in this case is our counter stain. It's used to stain the vegetative cell. So we add our safranin. We do not apply heat. We do not apply heat. So that's important because by not applying heat, that red dye is only going to get into the vegetative cell and it's not going to get into the endospore because if we were to steam it during that step, the red dye would get into the endospore as well. So we don't apply heat when we use the counter stain. And so when we do this step and we add our safranin and we let it sit for one minute, what's going to happen is, is you're going to end up with a red vegetative cell and a green endospore. Or in the case of a non-spore producer, it's going to be simply red. And so we add our safranin, we let it sit for one minute. After one minute, we dump off the safranin, we rinse with deionized water, and then we would air dry and view our slides under a 1000x total magnification. And so this is our procedure. So I'm gonna show you a video that shows you how to actually do the procedure. But first, I wanna show you what this slide would look like under the microscope. So this is, in fact, our Bacillus polymixa. And so what you can see is that this is a type of bacteria that is what we call streptobacillus. 
Strepto, remember, refers to chains. Bacillus are rod-shaped. So notice that we have these chains of these rod-shaped bacteria. And so if I look at these bacteria, you can see throughout this diagram here, throughout this slide, that we have our green endospores and we have our red vegetative cells. And so you can see all these groups of cells. Here's the green with the red around it. So again, the green is gonna be the endospore because that is the malachite green that has penetrated the spore by using steam. And our vegetative cells are going to be red. Now notice not every cell that's in this diagram has an endospore. That's because different cells are gonna undergo sporulation at different rates. Not all of them are gonna have this happen at exactly the same time. And so you will see some that have the endospore and some that don't. But again, you can see that in fact, this is a spore producing bacteria because you can see those green endospores and those red vegetative cells. Now, critical thinking question for you. What would happen in our experiment if we did this, so we used our bacillus polymixa, but we forgot to apply steam when we did the malachite green step? So let's say I did my malachite green step, I added my malachite green, but instead of steaming it, I simply just left it on my slide rack while I added the malachite green. What would my cells look like at the end of this procedure if I forgot to apply steam at the malachite green step? And the answer is, is at the end of the staining procedure, if I forgot to steam my slide, is the malachite green going to penetrate the spore? The answer is no, right? The malachite green is not going to be able to get in. So what you would see in that case is you would see the red vegetative cells and they would have a clear middle. They would have a white circle or clear circle in the middle. That's because the endospore is not going to stain because without steam, the malachite green can't penetrate uh, the spore. So by, by making a mistake and not steaming, our endospores are not gonna end up stained. They're gonna be colorless, but our vegetative cell would still be red. So we would end up with red rods with clear circles in the middle. That's what they would look like if we forgot to steam with the addition of the malachite green. And so let's look at the procedure for our endospore stain. So now I need to make my heat fix smear for my endospore. So what I have is I have a slide and on the frosted part, I've labeled it with my initials, the date, endo for endospore, and I labeled it BP. That's the organism that I'm going to be using for this experiment. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start off by just kind of wiping the glass clean so there's no fingerprints. And I'm gonna put my slide uh, frosted side up. Now, I need to add water to my slide. So I'm gonna take my loop, just to be safe because it's been sitting for a while. And I'm going to just heat it just to get rid of any bacteria that might be on there. Now, just like our other heat fix smears, I need to add water to my slide about the size of a nickel. And so to do that, I'm gonna use my squirt bottle and my loop, and I'm gonna add the water. So it's easiest to try and do it this way, put it on the loop to add it, rather than just simply trying to squirt it on there. So I have my water. It's about the size of a nickel. It doesn't really matter. Set that down. Now, when I transfer to my smear, remember that I want to use my needle so that I don't pick up too much bacteria. So I'm straightening my needle, and now I'm going to flame my needle, starting at the base, working towards the tip. And then while it's cooling, I'm going to unscrew the cap. This is Bacillus polymixa. This is the organism. You can see it growing on the slant. So I'm gonna loosen the cap, cap between my pinky and my ring finger, Flame it, 
take my needle and go in and pick up a little bit of bacteria, flame it, tap, set it down. I'm gonna take my needle, swirl it in the water, and I wanna make that about the size of a quarter. And I'm going to flame it. And I'm going to set that down. So now I have my endospore bacteria on a slide. I'm gonna put it on a slide warmer to dry. So now I'm ready to do my heat fix step for my endospore stain. So I'm gonna take my slide and I'm going to pass it through my flame three times. So one, two, three. Now that slide is ready to go and I'm ready to do my stain. So now I'm going to demonstrate my endospore stain. So again, I have my slide and my slide was heat fixed. So I've already passed it through the flame but now I need to add malachite green. Now, when I add malachite green, I need to steam my slide because the endospore is made of a tough keratin shell and it's difficult for the dye to penetrate without steam. So I have to steam the slide in order for the malachite green to get in. What I have set up is I have a tripod with some mesh and in it I have a beaker and the beaker has just tap water in it. I'm not gonna actually dip my slide in the water. All I'm simply doing is using it for steam. So I did turn it down so that it wasn't uh, boiling so rapidly, but I'm gonna turn it up a little bit. Okay, so now I'm gonna take my slide and I wanna lay it flat across. But again, to make sure that it doesn't fall into my beaker. The other thing that I'm gonna do is if my beaker is not flat, my liquid is gonna fall off as I try and do this. So sometimes I just kind of tap with my the back of my striker to get my slide to lay flat. And then I'm going to flood with my malachite green. So I'm just going to get some on my dropper and I'm just gonna add it to where the bacteria is. Now I need to steam for five minutes. So I need to watch this during that five minutes to make sure that it's not drying out. Notice again, I made sure to put my uh, frosted side up because that's the side that have, has my bacteria. If I did this backwards and I took my slide and put it upside down, I'm not gonna be staining my bacteria because it's gonna be on the other side. I'm going to turn down the water just a little bit. It's boiling pretty vigorously. And so this needs to sit for five minutes. And again, during that five minutes, I need to watch and see if it starts to dry out, which I can see some of it disappearing. So I'm gonna add a little bit more. Sometimes you might end up with the malachite green falling in the water, that's okay. But the more you have your slide flat, the less likely that is to happen. If your beaker is not on there straight and your slide is not flat, you're more likely gonna lose some of your dye along the way simply because it's tilted and it's gonna fall into the water. So mine's not really doing that, which tells me that my slide is fairly flat, so I'm okay on that. But I need to let this steam for five minutes. And again, that steam is going to open up the endospore so that the malachite green can penetrate. So I need to let that sit for five minutes. Okay, so now that five minutes has passed, I'm going to carefully grab my slide with my slide clip and I'm going to dump it into the waste, uh, staining waste. I'm going to rinse well with my deionized water. So I even turn it over and I get the back side just in case, but I'm going to very gently just kind of rinse above and let it run down so that I decolorize with the water. 
And there's still some on the back, so I'm going to get rid of that. Okay, so now that I've gotten rid of all the excess malachite green, I'm going to set my slide down for a minute, and I need to add the saffronin. And so my second step is going to be my saffronin. My first step was the malachite green. That's going to stain the endospore. And my saffronin is going to be used to stain the vegetative cell. Notice when I add the saffronin, there's no heat. So without heat, is that going to get the saffronin into the endospore? The answer is no. So I add my saffronin to where my bacteria is. And I let it sit for one minute. And again, the saffronin is going to be used to stain the vegetative cell. So I let that sit for one minute. After one minute, I'm just going to pick it up and dump off the excess saffronin and then just rinse to get rid of any excess. Again, you can rinse the back. And then you're going to be ready. I'm gonna give it a little more water. And then you're gonna be ready to use this. I can take my chem wipe and I can wipe the back because the back is not gonna have any bacteria. I can very gently blot the edge because I know the bacteria is not over there. But I would say overall, it's better to just take my slide and to let it air dry. And then once it's dried, then view it under the microscope at a thousand X total magnification. And you'll be able to see your endospores by doing it this way.